The Bible passage tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to chapter 2, verse 5. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 18. <clears throat> For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, the, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and the foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and, de and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or, or superior, uh, superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not the wise and the persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. This is God's word. Uh, I'm encouraged that the weather hasn't kept you away from worshipping God. Rain, hail or shine, we meet together to praise him and to hear from him. I am mindful uh, that now that we aren't officially singing, that we're sitting for a long time. Uh, so if you just want for a moment, just stand up, uh, stretch your legs just uh, so that you don't become too agitated. You can smile at someone, tell them you're happy that they're here, if you mean it. Give them an inch and they take a mile. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please, can you uh, have it open to the passage? If you listen carefully with that Beck's reading, you see we have a mighty passage before us. So let's, let's ask the Lord again for his help and his special uh, blessing upon our time. Our Father, we come before you and we are so privileged to be together as the called out ones of the world. 
as those who have been summoned by you, who have heard your voice and have been brought into the very family of God. Lord, we thank you for this time. Help us to remember uh, this is a special time where we open up your sacred book, your revelation to us, the the creator speaking to his creatures, and we pray that we would take your word very seriously. Open our eyes by your power, we pray, to see things that our eyes are often too dim to gaze into, and help us to receive things tonight uh, that we're often too stubborn or unwilling to accept. And we pray that you would firmly establish our feet, firmly establish us in the faith, and we pray that Christ would be truly lifted up. Come and meet with us in a special way tonight. We pray that it would be unmistakable to all of us that we have been in the very presence of Almighty God. For when we are in your presence, then we will leave changed. So we ask for that mighty work of your Spirit to be sent forth and to be accomplished amongst us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a look around at our church just at the moment. Have a look around the congregation and you'll see quite a few empty seats. There's quite a few empty spaces around if you have a look. Restaurants at the moment are in high demand. You have to make bookings. And daycare centres are in high demand. You have to book a year in advance. Shopping centres are in high demand. They're being constantly upgraded to meet those demands. Sports clubs are in demand. Not so much the church. Not so much the church. Not so much Christianity. Christianity is really considered no longer relevant, no longer applicable. Christianity is considered blind faith, ignorant of science, legalistic and really restrictive for living life. It's more of a coping mechanism for those who can't really deal with the difficulties of life. So Christianity is good for people like that. Everything about Christianity... At the present, everything seems unappealing to the masses out there that aren't in here, that are filling up those other places. What we hold dear, what we hold as absolutely precious and dear is considered foolishness and ridiculous and irrelevant. So how do we reach them? How do we reach such a people? How do we adjust? What do we adjust in order to get to them What do we do to reach them? I could hand out a survey tonight for you to answer that question. I might get many different responses from you. What would Paul say? Paul would say, we embrace the foolishness of God. That's what we do. We embrace the foolishness of God. I've got three points for us tonight. The first one I want to spend most of our time on, and then I will race through the last couple The first point we see in our text is God's foolish message. God's foolish message. Look just at the beginning of verse 18. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of salvation through the crucified Jesus of Nazareth is foolishness. It's it's ridiculous. It's kind of fiction. That's nonsense to those who are in the world. And he says specifically to those who are perishing, to those who don't believe it, they don't believe the message. Now, what is it that makes the message such nonsense or so foolish? Well, they would object and answer back, what about Christianity isn't foolish? What about the message isn't nonsense? What isn't ridiculous about it? We don't need to point one thing out. The divine being, God's own son, the one who is eternal, who is Lord over all, who is the king over the kings of the earth, the one whom God has appointed for judgment day to sit on the bench and judge all humanity. He leaves heaven, he becomes a man, comes to earth, and he is judged by his creatures and is condemned. 
this same Jesus. That's the message. And, and he's not slain simply by the Romans, but he's slain by the Jews. Their long-awaited Messiah, the one that they've been waiting for since the, gar- uh, since the garden. They end up killing him and crucifying him. And he ends up being rejected by the ones that he came to save. And that was the plan. And he was crucified. It's preposterous. It's ridiculous. It's madness. And it's a distasteful message too. It's kind of foul. Because we worship and esteem this one who was crucified. Now, go back quite a few decades. Go back a hundred years. And it actually used to be offensive to swear in public. It was offensive. It wasn't fitting for public discourse. Well, go back to first century. It was not fitting to mention crucifixion when you were meeting with people. You don't talk about that subject because it brings about disturbing images to the mind. It's uncomfortable. It exposes a person. It's humiliating. It's shameful. It's horrific. It's not for the faint-hearted and it'll give you nightmares. Can you remember what it sounded like as we walked past that man who was hanging on a cross for days? You don't talk about crucifixion. It's horrific. Now, Paul, he preached the cross. He preached the cross. Now, he never preached the cross as a tragedy and the resurrection as a remedy. And he never preached or skipped quickly or raced through preaching the cross so he could get to the better news of the resurrection. No, 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 because what you see with Paul is he, say, I gl-, he says, I glory in the cross. I boast in the cross. I rejoice in the cross. Woe to me if I do not preach the cross. The message, it says, verse 18 of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It always was foolishness. And friends, it always will be foolishness. It's foolishness to modern ears. The cross of Christ goes against everything that society and culture values, esteems, and pursues. We are all about self-gratification, comfort, ease, wealth, success, power, and honor. And the cross is just the opposite of that. It's rejoicing in weakness. It's of, it's of a Savior who lays down his life, who submits to his enemies, who doesn't pursue judgment, who chooses weakness over power and gives up what is rightfully his. It's foolishness to modern ears. It's distasteful to modern ears because what does the cross tell us? In a nutshell, you know it tells us you and I need saving. We need saving. The independent people who are so self-sufficient, they need saving. They need rescuing. And when you look at the cross and when you go and visit Calvary, you hear this message coming from the cross. Behold what your sins deserve as you look at the bloodied Son of God. It's what you deserve Have a good look at what you deserve. And so you can see that it is foolishness. It tells us that we are incurably evil and that we are wicked. And it tells us that we're rotten to the core. That's why we produce polluted fruit. Because at the very roots, we're dead. We're dead and we're sick. And this is what it shows us. And so the cross tells people who so esteem themselves, it says, count your best as rubbish. Come to the cross and trade your abominations for the merits of Jesus Christ. And it's foolishness. It's foolishness to unbelievers. And let me go a step further. It's aggravating to unbelievers. It's aggravating And so the world, they think they know wisdom. They have found a better way. 
Because man has achieved so much. Man has discovered so much. Man has accomplished so much. Man's grasp even reaches the stars, doesn't it? What about our technological advancement? We have everything in communication, in infrastructure and transport. We can do anything. What about our advancement in science? in studies of the earth and even of the cosmos? And what about our advancement in medicine? We can heal. We can cure. We can prolong and extend life through vaccines and treatment and professional surgeries. We should We should thank God for all of these gifts. Praise God if you're in the West. You don't need to fear dying of pneumonia. We should thank God for all of this wisdom he's given to man. And yet, for all our wisdom, all our learning, and all our advancement, we have not improved humanity one bit. Not one bit. Think about it. We have more communication than ever, and we are more self-centered than ever. We have more medicine, and yet we are more mentally sick than ever. We have more resources than ever before, and yet poverty and injustice reigns. We have more information, more policies, and yet wars abound. Fighting abounds. We are more learned. We have more information, and yet sinfulness doesn't reduce We have more studies and more PhDs and there are more marriage breakdowns and relational breakdowns. We are fed with more and more psychology and there are more and more psychologists and yet we are more depressed than ever. Listen, for all of our learning, for all of our understanding, all of our development... It has just made us more clever at coming up for excuses for our depravity. It's just true. I remember when I was teaching primary school and I was a relief teacher for a particular class one day and the teacher warned, uh, told me about a particular student. And I said to him, what's up with him? He's swinging off the chairs. He doesn't listen to anything. He rebels against every single thing. And he said, Nathan, you just need to understand, he's got ODD. And I said, what's that? And he said, oppositional defiance disorder. So any parent knows that every single child is born with that. It's not ODD, it's S-I-N. It's sin, and it came from our first parents. They had ODD. God says, you shall not, and man said, we will. That's what it is. That's what it is. And this is, for all of our learning and all of our human wisdom, we have not been able to fix the issue that humanity has always faced. We haven't. Why not? Why not? Look at verse 19. For it is written, this is God speaking, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Why can't we fix it? Because God has declared war on human wisdom. He's declared war on it. Listen, unbeliever, if you are not a Christian here, if you are not right with Christ, let me ask you, look at what the world has fed you all these years you've been alive. Look what it's fed you, and let me ask you, are you any better for it? Are you any better for it? How has it helped you? Has it restrained your lusts and your perverse thoughts? Has it done that? Has it given peace to your ever agitated conscience that you just can't live with? Has it given you hope in this life and hope for the next life? Hasn't, has it? Christian, Christian, let this be a reminder to you. Why would we ever seriously consider going back to what we used to hold dear? Why? Did it not leave you empty? Did it not leave you lost? The wisdom of the world, God has declared war on it. Look how God has opposed it. Look what he's done. 
the beginning of verse 21 there. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Man has always sought to bring down God, to unveil God, to bring him down to our level so that we can know him and know everything. This is just the Tower of Babel over and over again. We seek God to try and uncover him and unmask him through reason, philosophy, and science. We have tried all of these things, but at every turn, God blocks every move. God blocks every move. And God blinds every vain search. It says, God in his wisdom has prevented man through its wisdom to know him. And no, it's not just this knowledge about God, that there is a God. No, to know him. This is a relational term. Man through its wisdom cannot enter into a relationship with God. It cannot get to him. And, and we see this. Mankind can look at the most magnificent mountains and not see the Creator. Like we, we can behold a breathtaking sunset and completely miss the glory of God. Midwives and doctors who see the intricacies inside a mother's womb and the life that is formed and growing in there, they cannot see a designer. Just a couple of weeks ago, my wife gave birth to a little girl and straight after the birth, we're talking to the midwife who led us through the delivery. And she's saying all these things. When the baby was in the womb, it was breathing through the umbilical cord and it was being fed all these different ways. And this was happening and it was just incredible. And the moment the baby comes out, the body changes and it adjusts automatically and the baby knows to do this. And it's all of these things change about the baby. And, and it's just mind-blowing. And I just said to him passing, and some people believe in evolution. And she looked at me so awkwardly. Astronomers, through a telescope, can gaze at billions of stars and not know him, and not know him, and miss him. Verse 20. It's wonderful. Look, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Paul's talking about the intellectual elite of his day, the ones that everyone listened to. He's talking about the Jordan Petersons. He's talking about the Richard Dawkins. He's talking about the Ben Shapiros. He's talking about the elite, the psychologists. Uh, psychologists, the professors of science, of geology, of sociology, all these ones that we listen to, the ones that have a voice in society who are influential, the ones who we read their blogs, those whom the world listens to their podcasts, subscribes to their YouTube channels, the ones that influence us. Paul says, where are they? Has not God made it, made it all foolishness? How has God made it all foolishness? Made them all how? Look at verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. What's he saying here? They cannot, with all their learning, can't bring you salvation. They cannot bring you to God. And how does God show them as foolish? He makes them redundant. What do I mean by that? You just go back to a psychologist textbook written 60 years ago, and it's no longer prescribed reading for the current generation. These men and women who had all the answers about the human psyche and why we do what we do, they're in the rubbish bin and they've been replaced. Science, those who overthrew God have stripped him of his throne, go back a hundred years, their textbooks are in the bin. And they've been replaced. And guess what? The current ones will be replaced again. It's foolishness. It's foolishness. The world's wisdom God has made foolish. This world, human wisdom, it offers you a treasure map with no markings. It gives you a cup with a hole in the bottom. It offers you a parachute, parachute with no strapping. It's just nothing. It's foolishness. God has showed it as foolishness. 
God has opposed the wisdom of the world, its worldview, its philosophy, its remedies for living, its views on God, humanity, and living. He's made it foolish. So how can God be known? How can man be fixed? Because we've seen the world just offers dead ends. How can he be known? Again, verse 21. But God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now, the Bible says we can know about God through creation. That there is a God out there a designer, he's powerful and he's wise. We can know that, but we can't know him through those things. Paul is saying here, God is known through a message, hearing a message. We are saved through a message that must be taught to us, and we are saved. We know God through believing something. Now, notice what's so important here. It's not something that people want, and it's not the option or the way that people want. Have a look at verse 22. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. You see, people in Paul's day, they had a criteria that God had to fit in. So splitting up the two groups of the world, the Jews, they demanded signs. Any truth claims, any truth claims had to be backed up and verified by the miraculous, by the supernatural. And you see this in the Gospels. They're continually demanding signs from Jesus. Show us a sign to prove what you're saying. And they did it to the apostles too. Signs, signs, signs. And Jesus gave them innumerable signs. One of them, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And when they saw that it was so, what did the leaders do? They plotted together about how they might kill Lazarus because people were turning to Jesus. He gave them signs, but the demand for signs was insincere. It was a mask for unbelief. It was a mask for unbelief because the signs had to fit their criteria of wisdom and truth. And he says, that's what the Jews are like. The Greeks, they look for wisdom. Now, Paul is not anti-wisdom. He is not anti-wisdom. Why is he putting wisdom in a negative light then? Because in the context here, Greek cities, we're talking about Corinth here, Greek cities were the home of the most famous philosophers, right? Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, Socrates, all the elite, these Greek philosophers in these cities and this is what they love this is what the people loved you didn't go to the movies you went to hear public speaking discourses that was entertainment to hear things you've never heard before or to hear the mysteries of the world and that's what they gave them see this wisdom paul's talking about here is intellectual lofty grandiose language and knowledge Knowledge that is above lay people. What's impressive, Paul faced this amongst the Gentiles. We won't go to Acts 17, but he faced this amongst the Greeks there. This is what the people wanted. Jews wanted this. Greeks wanted that. This is what they want for religion. What did Paul give them? What did Paul give them? This is so important. This is so important. Look at verse 22 and 23. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to to Greeks. Now think about that for a second. Do you grasp what Paul's saying here? He's saying this, I know what Jews want. I know what will bring them in and fill the seats. I know what Greeks want and I know what will bring them in to fill the seats. I give neither of them what they want. Do you hear that? The Jews, they want signs. What do I give the Jews? I give them a foolish and offensive message of a crucified, anointed Messiah. To the Greeks who want a wise and lofty message, I preach to them the foolishness of God becoming a creature and dying and then rising from the dead. 
I give them the opposite of what they want. This is completely opposite. And he says there, look, I give them a stumbling block. Look at that word there, literally a message that trips them over, that disturbs them, that makes it hard for them. It's a stumbling block, literally in the Greek. I give them an offense, a cursed, humiliated, crucified, executed Messiah. And this, is, this was the Jews. Matthew 16, when Jesus foretells that he's going to be killed, crucified, Peter pulls him aside, that Jew, and he rebukes Jesus. That's not it, Jesus. No. And then Jesus pulls him aside and rebukes him. But Peter still doesn't get it because when you get to Gethsemane, after everything that Jesus said, the soldiers come to arrest Jesus and Peter pulls out his sword and starts fighting. Because a crucified, killed Messiah doesn't make sense. It's offensive, it's a stumbling block. We will not turn Israel upside down this way. A bloody Messiah, sure, but the blood of his enemies. Not his blood. Listen, he bled and he died for our wickedness and sin. Pastor, if you preach that, you're going to offend people. If you preach like that about sin, you're going to upset people. Pastor, if you preach so hard on sin and the need for Christ to be crucified in our place because the wrath of God is upon us, that's not what people will want. You're going to get more empty seats. Paul says we preach a stumbling block and we preach foolishness to the Greeks, what is opposite to their worldview. Everything they've been brought up, we preach the opposite. Nathan, you cannot grow a church if you preach hard on sin and a crucified Savior, you can't. How many times have I heard it? You cannot reach the youth. You cannot reach young people with a message that is so opposite to what they hear in their unis and with their friends. What does Paul say? For it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. So he says... Understand this, the church has always, always been under pressure to adjust, to change, to give the Jews and to give the Gentiles what they want, to give the people out there what they want. Give them signs. Give them wisdom. Something that matches their worldview. Something that will draw them in. The church has always been under pressure for this. But what is our message? We preach, verse 23, Christ crucified. What is the absurd way that God can be known? Through the cross. It's through the cross. For it pleased God to do this, it says. Look at verses 23 to 25. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Do you see what Paul's saying here? This is really wonderful, what God has done here. To the world, the crucified message of Christianity is offensive it's foolishness, it's weakness. But what does he say? But to those who are called by God, to those who believe, it's not a message of weakness, it's the very power of God, it's the opposite. To those who believe, it's not foolishness, it's the opposite, it's the wisdom of God. Do you see the difference? And so look at the two, look at the two, uh, the two destinations in verse 18, the two, the two pathways, the two results. Verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's not weakness at all. It's the power of God. Romans 1.16 is the verse that we should live by. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is. If you're a Christian, you can say amen. Firstly, we've seen God's foolish message. Now I'm going to be quicker here. Secondly, I want you to see God's foolish choice. 
God's foolish choice. Verse 26, just look at that first line. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. It's very important there. When you were called. This is when you were divinely summoned by God. This isn't that general calling, God calls out to everyone and whoever responds, they're called. No, 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 this is a divine summoning. You were called. This is your Damascus Road experience. When he grabbed you, took a hold of you, opened up your eyes that were blind and he gave you sight. When he raised the dead in you. Think about your calling. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Literally, consider, contemplate. I want you to think back on something. What kind of people, Paul's saying, did God save in Corinth? What, what, what is the kind of people that he saved? Is it the kind of people that he mentioned in verse 20? Is it the wise? Is it the scholars? Is it the elite? Is it the philosophers? It's the opposite. Look at verse 26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standard. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. What's Paul saying here? Corinth, take a closer look at your church membership directory. Have a look. Have a look across the congregation. Look at the kind of people that God saved. He has saved mostly nobodies. Now, look very carefully at the text. Paul doesn't say not any of you were wise or influential or noble. He says not many. God does save some who are really prominent in society. He does save some who are rulers, some who are philosophers. But he says not many. Not many. Look at verse 27 to 28. He continues on this. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. What are the kind of people that God so regularly saves? It pleases him to save the weak, to save the foolish in the world's eyes, to save the kind of people who are despised, Look, at one of them, he says there, to, 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 he chose the things that are not. That is offen- as offensive as you can get. He chose absolutely nothing. Some of you were zeros. You had no greater status than a slave or an animal. That's what he says. He chose the absolute nothings, the noughts, the zeros. Not many were wise, not many were influential. What's he saying? God doesn't choose the cream of the crop. Now, this is very fitting with Jesus' mindset and what Jesus revealed. Jesus utters a really disturbing and confronting prayer in Matthew chapter 11. He's preaching to the crowds. Many of them are rejecting him. In the middle of that discourse to the crowd, he prays publicly for all of them to hear. And this is what he says in verse 25. I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and you have revealed them to little ones. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. Everything I'm preaching, you were pleased to hide it from the wise here. It pleased you, and to reveal it to little ones, to to nobodies. You see, we often have this mindset. We often think, how, how amazing would it be if God saved that famous celebrity? Or or that incredible sports athlete. Or that politician. Wouldn't that be the best if God saved them? That wasn't Jesus' attitude at all. It wasn't. It wasn't. Those verses in 26 to 28, the lowly, the despised, the foolish. Isn't that a wonderful character bio of the 12 disciples that Jesus chose? It's a pretty good, accurate description, isn't it? Of the kind of people that he chose to be his witnesses to the world. Now, be faithful Bible students here. Be be careful Bible students. What is the key phrase in verses 27 to 28? What is the key phrase in verses 27 to 28? Verse 27, God chose the foolish. Verse 27, God chose the weak. Verse 28, God chose the lowly, the despised, the things that are not. Friends, why are some people saved? Because God chose to reveal himself to them. 
Understand this. People are not saved because they're more spiritual than others. Some people are not saved because they pieced it. They grasp it. They manage to comprehend it. Why? Because what's Paul been arguing? The philosophers, the wise, the scholars, the debaters, the elite, the most learned have not been able to comprehend Christ, but the nobodies have. I want you to think about this. That makes no sense. Imagine you give an advanced algebra test to one, to a mathematician, and two, a homeless slum kid. Both of them start the test. The mathematician cannot make sense of it at all. And he throws his hands up in the air and says, this is absolute ridiculous. And the, and the slum kid, uneducated, it all makes sense. And he gets through the whole thing. Now that scenario makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So my question to you is, how is it that the wisest, the brightest, the most learned and educated in the world can't receive Christ and can't comprehend him, but absolute zeros and nobodies can? What's the answer that Paul gives? God chose to hide himself from some, and he chose to reveal himself to others. He chose, he chose to save some. Look how he says it in another way. Look at verse 30. Verse 30. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. It is because of God. If you are a Christian, God did something for you that he didn't do for the next person. I don't know how any, any other way that he can say it. God chose, God chose, God chose. It is because of God that you are. Why has God done this? Verses 27 to 28 tell us. Why does he choose in this way? Well, one of the reasons is he chooses the foolish to shame the world's wise. He chooses those who are weak to shame the strong, he says. He, sh he chooses the nobodies to shame those people who are esteemed as somebody. Do, do, do you see what, what really pleases God here? Do, do you know what's going to please God? Take this in on Judgment Day. This is what's going to please God. Many in this world who were, who were influential and held esteemed and who were so looked up to, the somebodies on Judgment Day, they will be brought low and be shown to be seen as nobodies. And many who in this world were seen as nobodies on Judgment Day, God will raise them up and they will be seen to be His somebodies. And it pleased him. And it pleased him. Why else, does God, why else does it please God to choose in this way? Verse 29 and 31. Verse 29, so that no one may boast before him. Verse 31, therefore as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Why does he do this? Because nobodies can't boast, right? Zeros can't boast against a one or a two. This is what, see, players in the Australian football team, they can boast because only the best, only the best of the best make this, the national squad. Professors at Oxford University can boast of their position because only the brightest and the sharpest minds get that position. Christians cannot boast because they were not the cream of the crop. They were weak. They were nothing. They were foolish. They were sinful. They were unlovely and wretched. Christians can't boast because we who are weak were chosen by grace. We who were unlovely, he decided to love. You can't boast in that, can you? So I just want to say to you, Christian, whenever Scripture teaches predestination... Whenever Scripture teaches that God chooses some and he doesn't choose others, it's not meant to offend you. It's not meant to upset you. It's, caused you to, it's to cause you to stand before him and say, how could you have done this for me? Why me? My whole street is perishing and I'm worse than them. And you've loved me. And you treat me as a son. 
Grace is supposed to lead you to worship, not cause arguments and offend. It's wonderful and glorious. And Paul understood this. So even as he's in chains and about to die, he says, I am the chief of sinners in his, in his farewell letter to Timothy. The chief of sinners, the church planter of the world who suffered more than anyone for Christ, who, who was facing martyrdom for Christ, who wrote most of your New Testament. His pages are covered in his blood. As you read his epistles, if you listen carefully, you can hear the shackles as he's writing from prison. And he says, I'm the chief of sinners. He understood. He understood. He should never have received grace on that Damascus road. Well, we've seen God's foolish message and God's foolish choice. Let me just say one thing now, lastly, on God's foolish method. One thing, because we've run out of time. Let me read verses, chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise words and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Can you imagine going into a society? How foolish is this evangelistic approach? You go into Corinth, where there are celebrity speakers everywhere. They are idols in that community because they're so powerful in speaking. And they, and they gather such a massive following whenever they open their mouth. They speak like gods. Paul comes in and he says, I came in with not lofty words, with not persuasive words. I came in trembling. I came in fearful and weak. I didn't come in with a powerful, powerful discourse. It wasn't a dynamic sermon that I gave you. I did none of that stuff. I came to you in weakness, in fear and trembling. Why? His message style matched the message. In fear, weakness and trembling, he preached as a crucified man about a crucified Savior. Do you see, if Paul matched the elite of his time, it would have rendered the message powerless. If he won the people with powerful rhetoric, then he would have had to keep them with powerful rhetoric. Because if he preached a, a, great, a great oratory sermon and they followed him and they, were, and they were drawn to him, then a couple of weeks later, someone more powerful, someone more dynamic could come and lead them away. But he says, look, verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men, men's wisdom, but on God's power. Church, what do we do in these times? There's empty seats here. But as we prayerfully and patiently wait for God to fill these empty seats with new converts and new believers, we cannot adjust our message. What are we to do as we patiently wait on the Lord's time? What do we do? He calls us to embrace the foolish message of Christ and Him crucified. We do not give them what they want. We give them what we've been commanded and commissioned to give them. And the Lord will build His church. Amen. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Your Word does not originate in man Truly it is inspired, truly it is breathed out by God, truly it is powerful, truly it is the message that never changes, that's relevant for every generation, that's necessary for every person on the planet. Textbooks come and go, but your word will never go, and your word will never be powerless. Father, I pray for Castle Hill Baptist Church, I pray for us that as we are put under pressure 
even as other churches put pressure on us, I pray that we would not waver. I pray for every person in this room, oh Heavenly Father, that they would be solidified, that you would renew them in their confidence of the gospel as the power of God unto salvation. I pray that none of us in this pulpit or in our workplaces or in our homes would change the message of your Son who came to die for sinners. May we stand upon that word and may no one boast because the power and the glory and the honor belongs to you. We are your servants. Use us for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.